Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our public sector webinar series on data, privacy, and record keeping challenges. There are two uh, presenters for today's seminar. My name is Scott Crabb, and my co-presenter is David Benson. David and I have a long history of advising the public and private sectors on technology, privacy, and data management issues, both in respect of front-end work and in the context of disputes. Thank you very much for logging into today's session. Just as a reminder, the Perth team is holding another webinar for the public sector in August entitled, Reigning in Risk in Government Contracts. We certainly hope that you'll join us for that session. David and I will be taking questions during the last 10, 10 minutes of today's session. You'll find a Q&A function at the bottom right hand side of the screen. So please send through your questions at any time during that presentation. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end. Thank you also to those who have already submitted questions. If we don't get an opportunity to answer every question live, then we will aim to address feedback after the event. Please note that this session will also be recorded and circulated in coming days. Let me begin by outlining what this session is going to cover. Uh, the presentation will be divided into two parts. In the first section, I will cover a number of topics. I'll start by uh, briefly touching upon why you should be concerned about privacy. I'll then move on to the evolving regulatory landscape in relation to privacy and data sharing. We'll then turn to some key themes that have emerged in relation to information handling practices uh, and which have been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, finally, I will look at some of the regulatory issues that have arisen around using and dealing with COVID-19 personal information. When we were first devising this presentation, we were in a somewhat different place. Lockdowns were in full force. Uh, many people were working from home. Everybody was grappling with significant record keeping challenges arising from the COVID-19 crisis. Things have obviously moved on a fair bit, at least here in Western Australia, where workplace arrangements are starting to look a little more normal. So, we will not be focusing quite as much on the topic of record keeping challenges in this presentation. After I've covered the topics that I've just discussed, I will be handing over to David Benson, who will be covering best practice in relation to privacy and data management and how you can get ahead of the curve. In addition, David will cover data breaches. He'll, let you need, he'll explain to you what you need to know. All right, let's crack on. Why should you be concerned about privacy? Well, the first reason is that a significant section of the public are very concerned about how personal information that is being collected by public organisations is being handled. And that's particularly true of health information. Even those members of the public who haven't given much thought to issues of privacy and data management can be heavily influenced by the media and press coverage on these topics. And the media have been very quick to pounce on problems when they've arisen. This is illustrated by last night's Channel 9 news story in Perth, which you may have seen about a data breach, it, it seems by a government contractor, exposing medical records of the WA public. The purpose of the slide that you can see in front of you is to provide a bit of a snapshot of some of the more notorious data breaches and concerns about privacy in recent years that have involved or come out of the public sector. The slide will also help, I hope, to demonstrate the very instances in which these types of issues can arise. The first headline is Love Rival in Pathwest Privacy Breach. 
That was a headline from the West Australian newspaper last year, uh, which related to an issue that arose out of the actions of a Pathwest employee who was involved in a personal dispute and who disclosed the test results of one of the people with whom she was in a dispute. The second example, data breach sees records of 50,000 Australians, Australian workers exposed, that involve the accidental disclosure of personal information on a much larger scale. <clears throat> Here, the disclosure related to personal information about employees of several major financial institutions that was in the hands of a number of government agencies. In this case, the disclosure was made by one of the government's third party contractors. The third headline, Deep Draws, the Embarrassing Saga of Australia's Filing Cabinet Leaks, relates to the notorious Cabinet Files incident. You may recall that it was where the ABC was able to obtain large numbers of highly classified documents that had been left and forgotten about in filing cabinets that were later sold as second-hand furniture. What's particularly interesting about this headline is that it appeared in the Washington Post newspaper and that demonstrates the global appeal of these sort of stories. The final example, privacy advocates raise new concerns with COVID Safe app, uh, obviously relates to the COVID Safe app. As we shall see in a moment, in many respects, this app sets a new standard for privacy protection. But despite this, privacy advocates were very vocal about potential issues around privacy and data management. Let's talk a little bit more about the COVID Safe app. As most of you will know, the COVID Safe app is a voluntary app developed by the federal government, which is intended to trace outbreaks and combat the spread of COVID-19. It was fast-tracked for review in Australia following a successful implementation of similar applications in countries such as Singapore. The data collected by the application is used only by state or territory health officials to assist in the process of contact tracing. Importantly, it has a number of very significant privacy protections, and these are enshrined within the primary legislation which of course is the Privacy Act 1988 of the Commonwealth. The Australian Information Commissioner was given oversight of the COVID Safe Act and the notifiable data breach scheme applies to the app. Data is encrypted using what is described as a privacy but by design approach to collecting, using and disclosing personal information. A privacy impact assessment of the COVID Safe app was undertaken and has been made publicly available. The COVID Safe app's source code has also been made publicly available. And another safeguard is that all COVID Safe data must be deleted at the end of the pandemic. Now, this sets a very high bar for um, privacy protection and has implications for um, future forms of government data collection. Governments proposing to uh, release applications in the future or undertake other sorts of projects may now face broader levels of public interest in relation to data security and privacy protection. What is considered reasonable for privacy purposes is of course contextually based and relies on an element of trust. It's hard to see the very high bar that has been set by the COVID Safe Act being lowered again in the future, not only in relation to these sorts of apps, but other projects involving the collection and management of personal data. Government bodies are likely to face uh, a burden of justifying in the future how personal information will be protected. Privacy by, de by design is likely to be, seen, to be seen as a critical element. The undertaking and release of privacy impact assessments may well become more commonplace. And security and privacy protections are also likely to be a point of uh, focus. 
Now, some of you may be thinking this is all very interesting, but my organisation is not subject to privacy obligations like the Commonwealth Government or its agencies. Well, that's true, but it, it's likely to be that position only for a short time longer. Um, the headline on the slide that has just flashed up on the screen details how the government, WA government is moving to protect data, as most of you would know, and how the WA government is working on uh, privacy and data sharing legislation. The short point here is that the regulatory landscape is evolving and you need to be clear about uh, which way uh, the regulatory landscape is heading. So let's briefly have a look at it. Um, as most of you probably already know, the Privacy Act uh, of 1988, a Commonwealth piece of legislation, governs the handling of personal information by Commonwealth agencies and certain other bodies. All Australian states and territories other than South Australia and Western Australia have privacy legislation governing, governing the handling of personal information at state, territory and local government levels. New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia have enacted data sharing legislation and the Commonwealth Government is currently developing and designing a new data sharing and release bill. The, the WA Government is developing a legislative framework for privacy and data sharing as the slide that you saw a moment ago demonstrates. Any new arrangements under data sharing legislation uh, are likely to be developed in a way that ensures consistency with the existing regulatory requirements under the Commonwealth Privacy Act. Why is that? Well, in part, that is being driven by the requirement in the proposed Commonwealth data sharing laws that state and territory users of information collected by the Commonwealth uh, are covered by the Privacy Act or a state or territory law that provides equivalent protections to the Privacy Act. And there's an additional point, which is that if WA were to enact data sharing arrangements that do, that do not align with the manner in which members of the WA public expect their personal information to be used, it will not be met with community acceptance. And without community acceptance, data users, such as researchers and government agencies that rely on uh, the provision of information by the public will not be able to carry out their current activities as fully and effectively as possible. The WA government's released a discussion paper which examines the issues and it's well worth reviewing for those who are interested in this area. One feature that I personally find interesting is the adoption of the so-called five safes upon which decisions about data sharing will be made. The first safe is safe data. Is the data appropriate to be used for the proposed purpose and capable of being identified? Safe people, can the recipients be trusted to use the information in an appropriate manner? Do they have appropriate skills and training? Do they have systems to restrict personal information to the right people? The next safe is safe settings. Does the, does the recipient have appropriate systems for storage, ac access and use of information? Does the recipient have an appropriate security system in place? What is the risk of disclosure? These are all questions that will need to be asked. Safe outputs. Is the disclosure or publication of the data or information appropriate? Have risks of identifying individuals been addressed? And finally, safe projects. Is the data sharing an appropriate use of information? Is sharing of the data for the public good and will it provide value? Will there be unreasonable risks or detriments if no sharing of the data occurs? There are some key issues for the WA government, obviously, in designing a legislative regime. A couple of prominent ones include whether privacy and data sharing laws should be included together in one omnibus piece of legislation or whether the government should enact privacy legislation as a separate standalone piece of legislation for data sharing legislation. 
Another key issue is whether to minimise the impact on privacy, the data should only be shared and used for quite narrow purposes, such as informing policy making, service planning and design, or whether data uh, can and should be shared for broader purposes. Uh, this is obviously where the inherent tension between privacy and data sharing comes to the forefront. Um, as the regulatory structure for privacy and data sharing in WA is developed, we may see some or all of the following types of outcomes. Privacy laws applying to local government and also contracted services providers to, to governments, particularly health service providers. We may see a consent-based model providing individuals with greater control over the handling of their personal information. We may see data sharing occurring on a de-identified basis whenever possible to minimise the privacy impacts of the scheme for individuals. There may be, and in fact I think there are very likely to be safeguards and protections commensurate with those under the Commonwealth Privacy Act, which could possibly include offences for unauthorised use and disclosure of information. I expect that we will see additional safeguards where data is shared uh, for commercial purposes. We're likely to see annual reporting and mandatory notification of possible data breaches. And I think we're also likely to see the introduction of a privacy code, similar to the Australian Government Agency's Privacy Code, which commenced on 1 July 2018. So that's a bit of a snapshot of the evolving regulatory landscape and gives you an idea, I hope, about where this is all heading. Turning then to some of the key themes that have been highlighted in relation to information handling by the COVID-19 pandemic. The first of those is the very, the very significant potential value, benefits and insights that can be obtained in using personal information and data in public administration and policy. This should provide impetus to the data sharing reforms which I've discussed earlier. However, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's an inherent tension between data sharing for public and community purposes and the need to protect privacy of personal information. And it's hard to get the balance right. There are some key drivers for the community in considering privacy issues. Trust is critical. It can be the determinative factor in deciding to provide personal information voluntarily. And obviously, context is also important. What is considered reasonable will very much depend upon the circumstances. Privacy by design, I think, is going to be a very significant issue going forwards. What is privacy by design? Well, it, it means, in essence, building privacy into the design specifications and architecture of new systems and processes, rather than trying to retrofit protect privacy protections at the back end of the process. The fourth major theme that's arisen in relation to information handling is that of the large-scale workplace changes that we have seen. By that, I mean working from home and other flexible working practices. These, of course, present challenges. Government agencies must have in place a record-keeping plan and proper processes to ensure that employees catch, capture all government records. During the pandemic, a proportion of public sector employees have been working fle flexibly, including working from home. Not all, as I understand it, but uh, quite a number. Uh, this was a change which happened quite suddenly, and many workplaces, and this is true also in the private sector, may not have had time to put in place appropriate processes, infrastructure and security measures to deal with potential record keeping and information handling issues. To take one example, employees may be using their private email. Another example, saving documents on their home computers, using networks that are not secure, or even making handwritten notes which are kept at home rather than at the office. For the reasons I discussed earlier, this. We're not going to focus on this topic in any great detail in this presentation. However, I would note that guidance on managing records in a COVID-19 environment was issued by the State Records Office back in March of this year, 
and it's well worth reviewing that guidance if you've got any queries. So what kind of personal information has been collected in the COVID-19 environment? Well, uh, the, the range of personal information that, about COVID-19 matters that has been collected both as an employer and as a service provider by the public sector includes whether an employee or their family members have tested positive to COVID-19 and with whom the infected person has had contact. Whether a member of the public who has tested positive to COVID-19 has been using government facilities, such as entering into a government building, catching public transport or being treated in a public hospital. Another example is whether an employee or a member of the public has recently travelled overseas or interstate. This collection of personal information gives rise to a number of current or emerging regulatory issues and it's worth briefly looking at some of those. The first issue is the potential over collection of personal information. In other words, collection of more personal information that is necessary to fulfil or is directly related to a particular function or activity of, of a government agency. A second issue is lack of transparency around the purposes for which information is collected and its potential use for secondary purposes. Here, agencies may not be taking reasonable steps to ensure that individuals are aware of the purpose of collection of personal information and of possible secondary uses of that information. Another issue is that of storage. Agencies are no doubt grappling with the question how COVID-19 related personal information should be stored. A number of subsidiary questions arise at this point. How long will personal information need to be collected? There's an elastic time frame here. We don't know when the pandemic will be over because the situation is dynamic and rap rapidly changing as we have seen in the events in Victoria and New South Wales over the course of the last week. Another question is how COVID-19 related personal information, uh, how long it should be retained and stored once the immediate crisis is over? How long should one keep it in case something happens in the future? There's a question about whether agencies should be destroying the information that they have collected once there is no longer any need to keep it. And if so, when that destruction should occur. Obviously, there are issues other than privacy at play in deciding what to do with COVID-19 information, including the need to maintain the integrity of government records and to retain information that may be valuable as a public health resource. Another question that arises in this context is whether the personal information can readily be de-identified. So let's turn to the lessons and action points in relation to COVID-19 related personal information. First comment we would make is that agencies should be anticipating regulatory developments, but also look to be acting in a manner that fosters public trust and promotes transparency. Trust is a key issue, as I've said earlier on, and agencies should be mindful of maintaining trust with their employees and with the public. If this trust is breached, individuals be less, will be less likely to provide personal information to public sector agencies going forward and less likely to cooperate in programs. It's important to collect only COVID-19 personal information that is necessary for the particular lawful, lawful purpose in question. Agencies should not be collecting more information than they require. It's very desirable, desirable to be transparent around what information is being collected, why it's being collected and how it will be used, including for any secondary purposes. It's advisable to provide clear notice of these matters when collecting information, even if you're not strictly obliged to do so. If possible, we recommend avoiding the process of commingling COVID-19 related personal information with other 
information co-mingling may create issues. For instance, it may heighten the risk that information may be improperly accessed, used or disclosed. There may also be a heightened risk that the information may inadvertently be used for a secondary purpose without proper consideration of whether this is appropriate and what additional safeguards such as de-identification might need to be imposed. If possible, we recommend that the personal information is stored in a manner where it can be easily extracted at a later date when it is no longer needed rather than being commingled with other information. In an ideal world, the specific COVID-19 related personal information would be siloed from other personal information. For example, an agency might store information about employees who have tested positive to COVID-19 separately to their personnel files. However, we recognise that siloing information may be difficult because information, information may need to be read with other information held by an agency to make sense of that information. If that is the position, then consideration ought to be given as to how the information can be separately tagged and extracted at a later date. At an appropriate time, once you no longer need to keep the information, as I noted before, there may be a question as to whether it is appropriate to destroy the information. That's obviously an important question which needs to be grappled with properly. All of these recommendations that I've just discussed are consistent with the guidance on collecting personal information for contact tracing issued by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Well, that ends my part of the presentation. I'll be back at the end to deal with questions. In the meantime, please allow me to hand over to my co-presenter, David Benson. Thank you, Scott. Um, as Scott has mentioned, the engendering of trust in members of the public is key to having them engage with your organisation and being prepared to share personal information. One way in which this trust can be engendered is by demonstrating that your organisation engages in best practice when it comes to privacy. What is best practice for each organisation will depend on a variety of things. In particular, what are the nature of the activities of the organisation and what personal information does it actually collect? It's a, it is of course impossible for us to provide today a complete picture of best practice in all assets, all facets rather, of privacy in the time we have available. So what I propose to do is to focus on four key areas where organisations can consider addressing um, uh, for the purposes of implementing a best practice approach to privacy. Those focus areas are implementing the Australian Government Agency's Privacy Code, ensuring that privacy impact assessments are conducted as a part of all new projects, data security and being prepared to have to make any data breach notification that might be necessary. The Australian Government Agency's Privacy Code sets out specific requirements and key practical steps that Commonwealth Government agencies must take as part of complying with Australian Privacy Principle 1.2. That privacy principle requires that organisations and agencies take steps as are reasonable in the circumstances to implement practices, procedures and systems relating to the entity's functions or activities which A, ensure that the entity complies with the Australian privacy principles and B, will enable the entity to deal with any inquiries or complaints from individuals about the entity's compliance with the APPs. The code requires agencies to move towards a best practice approach to privacy governance so as to help build a consistent high standard of personal information management across all the Commonwealth Government agencies. The code commences on the 1st of July and applies to all Australian Government agencies subject to the Privacy Act. Of course, the code does not bind state or local governments or their agencies. However, in the circumstances described by Scott, where we are likely to face a scenario where Western Australia enacts its own privacy legislation in the next 12 to 18 months, the code can be used as a, as a best practice benchmark by state and local governments as they prepare for regulation. 
The code specifically requires Commonwealth government agencies to have a privacy management plan that identifies specific measurable goals and targets and sets out how an agency will meet its compliance obligations under APP 1.2. It requires agencies to appoint a privacy officer and ensure that particular functions are undertaken. It also requires the appointment of a senior official within the agency to act as privacy champion, who is responsible for providing cultural leadership within the organisation and promoting the value of personal information. It also requires the undertaking of privacy impact assessments, a topic to which I will return shortly. It requires a register of all such privacy impact assessments to be published on the agency's website so that the public can see that the relevant agency is undertaking these assessments prior to embarking on new projects. And finally, it also requires Commonwealth government agencies to take steps to enhance internal privacy, privacy capability. And this includes providing annual training to employees who have access to personal information. And it also requires all employees uh, when they're on board with the organisation to receive privacy training as well. So I mentioned privacy impact assessments. Whenever an agency is considering a new project, it's my view that consideration should be given to the undertaking of a privacy impact assessment, regardless of the size of the project. A PIA identifies how a project can have an impact on individuals' privacy and if done correctly, will incorporate recommendations for managing, minimising or eliminating privacy impacts. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner recommends that organisations and agencies conduct PIAs as part of their risk management and planning processes. Failing to undertake a PIA, at least in the Commonwealth um, sphere, may result in a project failing to meet legislative privacy requirements as well as community privacy expectations, which Scott described um, as being incredibly important. This can obviously lead to reputational damage and loss of credibility through lack of transparency and awareness to public expectations. There are a variety of benefits um, associated with undertaking a privacy impact assessment, including ensuring that any project is compliant with privacy laws, reflecting community values around privacy and personal information in the project design, reducing future costs in management time, legal expenses and potential negative publicity by considering privacy issues at a very early stage in a project, identifying strategies to achieve the project's goals without impacting on the privacy of individuals. It can also help to demonstrate to stakeholders that the project has been designed with privacy in mind. And Scott spoke earlier about how privacy by design is likely to become a key theme in all um, government privacy uh, handling uh, situations. A PIA can also promote awareness and understanding of privacy issues within an organisation or an agency. It can contribute to broader organisational or agency risk management processes. And it also assists with building community awareness and acceptance of projects through public consultation. I also mentioned the importance of data security. The Privacy Act and the Associated Australian Privacy Principles, as well as other legislation, regulate the handling and security of personal information. Similar obligations to those contained in the Commonwealth legislation will almost certainly be imposed on state government organisations or agencies by the new privacy legislation, which is likely to be enacted here in the next 12 to 18 months. So it is useful for us to consider what the obligations under the Commonwealth legislation look like. APP 11 requires relevant organisations and agencies to take active measures to ensure the security of personal information they hold and to consider whether they are permitted to retain personal information for particular periods of time. These organisations and agencies are required to take reasonable steps to protect personal information from misuse, interference and loss. And they're also required to take reasonable steps to destroy or de-identify personal information they hold once it is no longer needed. 
And Scott spoke about the fact that, at least in the context of the data that is to be collected by the COVID Safe app, it is to be deleted at the end of um, the, the pandemic. What will qualify as reasonable steps will depend on the circumstances of the particular case, including the nature of the activities of your entity, the amount and sensitivity of personal information held. For example, health information is likely to be considered more sensitive. The possible adverse consequences that may flow from a data breach, the practical implications of implementing security measures, um, including the time and cost involved. As you'll see on the right-hand side of the slide there, um, we've got a, a graphic which might be described um, as the information life cycle. When handling personal information, you should consider how your organisation will, will protect personal information during the various stages of the information life cycle. Personal information security throughout the, the life cycle involves considering whether it is actually necessary to collect and hold personal information in order to carry out the organisation's functions or activities. Planning how personal information will be handled by embedding privacy protections into the design of information handling processes and the broader processes of your organisation. Assessing the risks associated with the collection of personal information due to a new act, practice, change to an existing project or as part of business as usual. Taking appropriate steps and putting into place strategies to protect personal information that you hold. And finally, the destruction or de-identification of the personal information that your organisation holds when it is no longer needed. Obviously, one of the key things um, that an organisation needs to take account of when considering security is the implementation of appropriate security measures. Appropriate security measures for protecting personal information should be, regard, should be um, considered in regard to all of your entity's acts and practices. Examples of steps and strategies that may be taken include governance, culture and training in the workplace amongst your staff. In particular, you should aim for personal information security to be, to be an integrated component of your entire business. And this requires stressing to staff at every available opportunity, the importance of every member of the organisation being alive to maintaining the security of the data which is held by your organisation. It also requires the establishment and maintaining of internal practices, procedures and systems that ensure compliance with the APPs. Obviously, uh, implementing effective information technology security, which protects both your organisation's hardware and software from misuse and interference, unauthorised access modification and disclosure. You should also consider how the security of the systems which your organisation has in place interact with your broader ICT system, including websites, social media platforms, desktop terminals and Wi-Fi networks. It's also important to consider access security and monitoring controls to ensure personal information is only accessed by authorised persons. This is something which um, government agencies are already very good at doing. And finally, it's important to ensure protection of personal information that may be handled by third party service providers. And we've seen one example, as Scott mentioned, overnight of um, a, an apparent uh, breach by a third party service provider enabling third parties to gain access to personal information that was perhaps held by one or more government agencies. So why are security um, obligations now one of the primary drivers for best practice privacy? Well, in large part, that's because of the introduction of the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme, which was introduced into the Privacy Act in 2018. And it's really shining a torch on the prevalence and cause of data breaches in this country. What I'm going to do now is take you through some of the more interesting statistics which have come out of the OAIC's most recent report on the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme. The first figure that you can see on the screen um, now um, shows the number of data breaches that have been reported. 
So in the last, uh, the last reporting period, notifications were up 20%. And if you actually go to all of the reports that have been issued by the OAIC since the data, notifiable data breach scheme came in, you will see that there is a general trend upwards as uh, more and more data breaches are notified. You'll also see that there was a slight increase in malicious or criminal attacks, um, which has a, resulted in a corresponding desire, uh, sorry, decline in, uh, in breaches as a result of human error. So on this slide, we have the details of the number of individuals that were affected by each breach. And this is a piece of information that an organisation is required to report to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner whenever reporting a notifiable data breach. So here you'll see that there are many instances where the data breach has affected thousands of individuals. So for example, there were 41 cases where 1,000 to 5,000 individuals were affected. Now, one can imagine that government agencies are in some certain circumstances at greater risk of um, experiencing breaches which affect large, number of, uh, larger numbers of individuals simply as a result of the volume of data which is held by those organisations. Breaking down the human error category a little further, the vast majority of the breaches have recurred as a result of sending personal information to the wrong recipient. Obviously, we can all accept that mistakes will happen, but it's important that uh, individuals within an organisation are made aware of the types of things that can go wrong so that they can have regard to the risk that they face in engaging in their day-to-day -day activities. And as for the malicious or, or criminal attacks, unsurprisingly, the threat continues to be largely external. And there's been plenty of recent media coverage in relation to the increase in attempted cyber attacks on Australian businesses and government agencies following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just focusing for, for a while longer on, on cyber incident breakdowns, um, you'll see on the top right there that the, the largest category of breaches arise from phishing or compromised credentials. So one thing which your organisation can do is engage in, engage in extensive training programs which identifies to individuals the type of phishing campaigns that can, can occur and the risks that they pose to your organisation. One of the other things that can be done by your organisation to try and min minimise this risk is to um, implement um, more stringent security, um, such as using passphrases rather than passwords. Um, another thing which has uh, a another security uh, step that can be taken is the introduction of multi-factor identification. And with the onset of, uh, well, with smartphones and the like, there are plenty of programs now or applications which enable MFA to be implemented without imposing significant um, additional time constraints on your employees. But even best practice security policies, practices and training will not prevent all data breaches. So what does best practice look like in the event that a data breach occurs? One of the key things that you can do to ensure best practice is to have a comprehensive and tested data breach response plan. A data breach response plan sets out procedures and clear lines of authority for staff in the event that an organisation experiences a data breach or suspects that a data breach has occurred. Your organisation's your organization's actions in the first 24 hours after discovering a data breach are crucial to the success of your response. Research also suggests that the cost to an organisation of a data breach can be significant and implementing a data breach response plan can assist in mitigating these costs significantly. A data breach response plan is one tool to help you manage such a breach. It is a framework which sets out the roles and responsibilities for managing an appropriate response to a data breach 
as well as describing the steps to be taken by an entity in managing a breach if one occurs. And it's important to, to remember that a data breach scenario may often be a crisis scenario for the organisation. And there's a lot of moving pieces and there's a lot of unknowns. That being so, having a well-structured and tested plan will assist your organisation to respond appropriately. In my view, a plan should include the actions to be taken if a breach is suspected, discovered or reported by a staff member, including when it is to be escalated to the response team, the members of your data breach response team and who is responsible for undertaking particular actions, and the actions that the response team themselves are expected to take, including uh, with respect to reporting to management and perhaps outside the organisation if necessary. Your data breach response plan should be in writing so you, the members of your organisation who are responsible for it can easily access, access it and understand what will happen in the event of a data breach. But you also need to regularly review your plan and test it to make sure that it is up to date and your staff knows what actions they are expected to take in the event of a data breach. What is regular in this context will depend on the circumstances and how often your organisation changes its information handling practices. But nevertheless, um, I would suggest that at least annually, the members of your data breach response team should get together and run through the, po the, the policy or the plan and also go through a simulated exercise as to how they would deal with a data breach in reality. So whether your organisation is currently subject to legal obligations or not, the public expects that government agencies at all level will ensure that their personal information is handled carefully and in a manner which respects their privacy. Government agencies at all levels are particularly susceptible to the reputational damage that a failure of privacy practices can cause, even when they have done everything to the letter of the law. The Australian Government Agency's Privacy Codes provides a framework for both government and organisations to target, to work towards and to achieve best practice in privacy through its focus on privacy management plans and the conducting of privacy impact assessments. Prevention is obviously very much the aim when it comes to personal information security. Having the right security policies in place can prevent breaches and the notification obligations which flow from them. However, it's also important to be prepared for something to go wrong. One key way in which agencies can be prepared to implement a comprehensive tested data breach response plan, which will guide the agency's actions in the event of a data breach. However, it's not just simply enough to prepare such a plan and to stick it in the drawer, as I mentioned. It is important the agency provide training as to how the plan operates, that the plan be reviewed regularly and that it be tested in breach simulations. Before we address questions received during the webinar, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you have specific feedback relating to your organisation, then please reach out separately to Scott or myself. Um, Scott, would you like to deal with the first question that's come through? Yes, thank you, David. Yes, thank you, David. I've had a, uh, uh, I have a question here, which is about how, hello there. I have a question here about how the COVID Safe app works. Now, I'm not an expert in the software engineering or design, but at a high level, my understanding is that the app works this way. First, that the user downloads the app onto his or her mobile device. The user inserts his or her name, a pseudonym, uh, an age range, a mobile phone number and postcode, uh, and, and verifies uh, the mobile number. This information is then uploaded in encrypted form to the National Coded Safe data store. Bluetooth, Bluetooth signals on the user's smartphone or mobile device records close contacts with other users of the app and stores this data locally, in other words, on the, on the mobile device. 
if a user of the app tests positive for COVID-19, he or she will be contacted by a health official in the relevant state or territory as part of the usual contact tracing process and asked about use of the COVID Safe app. If the person has the app, the person is then sent a code to enter into his or her mobile device. If the code is entered into the device, the user can consent to the uploading of the encrypted data about the close contacts to the data store. Once uploaded to the data store, state or territory contact tracers can access the information to notify persons who have been close contacts of the uh, COVID positive user of the app. If the user doesn't come into contact with a COVID-19 positive user who consents to releasing information, the encrypted data is deleted on a rolling 21 day basis. So if you always wondered how, how it works, that in, in broad terms is, is, is the process. Thanks, Scott. Um, another question that we've been asked is what steps can agencies take to minimise the risks associated with the disclosure of personal information when third party contractors are engaged? Well, the easiest way for an organisation or agency to manage such risk is to include comprehensive privacy provisions in any contractual documents. I would expect that a comprehensive privacy clause um, would, it would require compliance with the privacy laws. It would also impose obligations with respect to the way in which information is to be held, so security requirements. It would impose obligations um, with respect to notification in the event that there is any suspected breach of any statutory obligation or there's been a data breach. And finally, it would contain a contractual indemnity for losses suffered by the organisation or agency in the event that um, there was some sort of breach. However, it's really important to bear in mind that contractual obligations, including indemnities, are unlikely to provide redress for the reputational harm that could be suffered by an agency where there has been a failing by a contractor. Accordingly, um, I, I would suggest that it's really important for government agencies to do um, some level of due diligence on third party contractors um, before they are engaged and before personal information is disclosed to them. Um, Scott, did you have another question there to answer? Uh, it was more in the nature of the comments. One of the participants in today's seminar has helpfully reminded us that of the announcement made by the Department of Premier and Cabinet last week that in terms of timing of uh, privacy and data sharing legislation, there has been an impact as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and bearing in mind that that is still subsisting and that the uh, timing of an election, it seems likely that um, the privacy legislation will only be finalised and enacted um, sometime in 2021. Now, this is, of course, consistent, David, with the time frame that you talked about uh, earlier of, of 12 to 18 months. Um, but that's a very useful clarification, and I, I thank the person who sent that comment through. I think it does, reckon, it, it does provide a helpful reminder that there is a bit of time available to agencies to take advantage of the recommendations that David's talked about in terms of getting ready for the changes that are likely to occur. Thank you, Scott. And just uh, echoing those comments, one of the key themes that we've discussed today is the importance of building a culture within your organisation with respect to the handling of personal information in an appropriate way. And um, culture is not something that you can build overnight. So the fact that state government agencies have some time to um, continue to develop the already strong culture they have uh, with respect to the handling of personal information will no doubt be welcome. Um, we're conscious of the time, um, but there's, uh, there's another query that we've been asked. The question is, do you have any comments on the interaction between Commonwealth legislation that allows the publication of reports required by stakeholders and the potential breach of Privacy Act obligations 
where those reports may contain limited personal information, such as names and signatures. Um, the primary comment that I would have in relation to that is that this is an issue which is no doubt managed by consent, whether that consent be either express or implied. And most collections or uses of personal information can, can occur provided that there is consent obtained from the individual uh, concerned. I mentioned that consent can be express or implied. Um, obviously, having express consent is always better because you have something that you can point to if ever, anyone ever raises an issue associated with your uh, handling of personal information. But there are instances where it can be implied, and in, in cases such as government reports, which feature the signatures of committee members and the like, um, I think in the vast majority of instances, um, it would be assumed that those committee members were aware that their personal information was going to be used in that way, and um, there is implied consent uh, to the inclusion of that information in, in the particular report. Thank you everyone for joining us online today. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to follow up directly with either Scott or me. Um, we'd also love to hear your feedback on the session and we'll be sending around a post-webinar survey in the next few days. The survey is also a great opportunity for you to be able to tell us how we can shape these conversations in the future and tell us what other topics you might like to hear about. Thanks again, everyone. Um, we look forward to you joining us for another one of these webinars in due course. Goodbye.